Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Przez tę Ewangelię jesteście zbawieni, jeśli mocno trzymacie się słowa, które wam głosiłem. Inaczej wierzyłeś na próżno. Panani salam tu alaikum fil awal ma qabiltu ana aydan. Anna al Masih mata min agla al khataya, khataya hasab al kutub. Wa annahu dufin. Conforme a las escrituras, que fue sepultado y que resucitó al tercer día conforme a las escrituras. Or kafe ko tabaraho ko di ke dia. Después apareció a Jacobo, luego a todos los apóstoles. Bo jestem najmniejszy ze wszystkich apostołów i nawet nie jestem godzien nazywać się apostołem, bo prześladowałem Kościół Boży. And his grace to me was not without effect. Hello, Purpose Church! Come on and stand to your feet! Happy Easter! Can I get a shout in this place? Come on! Yeah! I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can contain it, can't keep it to myself. There are none of colors to paint the whole picture. Not enough words to ever say what I found. Come on and sing it with me. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy. He is merciful and powerful. Who are we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who are we talking about? the rounds without joining the chorus there aren't enough notes to make the harmony it's the song of the angels through all of the ages we call it the earth and heaven symphony wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy merciful and my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. Give him all the honor, 
today. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Feel free to have a seat. Welcome. Well, welcome to Easter with Purpose Church. What a joy it is to be together celebrating Easter Sunday. My name is Claire, and I get to serve as our student ministries pastor here. And we want to welcome all of you joining us, everyone inside our worship center, everyone outside braving the rain on the community terrace. Hello to everyone tuning in online, and welcome to everyone joining us from one of our Microsoft sites that meet all across the city of Pomona. We are so glad that you're here, and we hope that you feel right at home. In fact, we'd love to invite you to keep being a part of our community and join us one week from today, next Sunday, at 8.30, 10, or 11.30 a.m., where we are starting a brand new series called A Better Way, How Navigating Hard Stuff Looks Different When Jesus Leads. And whether whether this is your first time here with us or this is your first time visiting in a while, we'd love to take a few moments to share with you a little bit about what our church is all about. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a volunteer here at Purpose Church. What I love about serving in this community is that we are a diverse, vibrant, and multi-generational church. Everyone from the age of zero to 100 and beyond has a place in this family. Purpose Kids provides nursery care, kids choir, and various other programs to share God's love through age-appropriate messages and activities. Our screened and trained volunteers lead kids through games, worship, Bible stories, and prayer to build their faith. For those in junior high and high school, we have a program where life-changing experiences happen weekly through Bible teaching, life groups, mentorship with adult leaders, and of course, awesome games. And no matter if you're single or married, just starting your career, or an empty nester, we have a community for you. Groups range from young adults to senior adults meet on and off campus to build authentic relationships in Christ. Well, life can be difficult at times, and at one point or another, we all experience a hurt, habit, or hangup. Our Celebrate Recovery Group is open to everyone who needs a safe space to find support. And this is just a fraction of what takes place at our church. To get to know us more, come back next Sunday for our welcome lunch at 1245, or check out our Instagram, YouTube channel, or website. And I know that no matter what age or stage group you're in, we have somewhere just right for you. So welcome to Purpose Church, and welcome home. As you can see, we have a place for every single one of you. And for a full list of everything that God is up to here at Purpose, please go online to purposechurch.com. Now, as you saw, one of our values here is we believe that generous people transform the world. So we are going to continue our worship at this time through the giving of our gifts and our offerings. And if you are brand new with us this morning, please do not feel pressured by this time. This is an opportunity for those of us who call purpose our home to live out that value and live generously just as we've experienced the generosity of Jesus. So as we prepare to do that, would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. And thank you that every person here and listening is not here by accident. God, all of us come into this room and um, come to you with burdens and worries, maybe brokenness in our lives, and maybe some big questions about you and about this life. And Jesus, we just ask that you would meet every person exactly where they are. Would you overwhelm them with your great love for them. And God, we praise you for the joy and hope and love that we get to experience through you starting even right now. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you all the praise. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him as he died. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. And he was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. I looked on the floor and I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew he rose. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death. Nails in his hands. Nails in his feet. A crown of thorns on his head. For you. He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive. Amen, y'all. That's good. That's good. That's good. Well, welcome to Purpose Church and happy Easter. My name is Eric and I'm one of the pastors here and we are literally just so delighted and glad that you would be joining us today as we celebrate Jesus. And this is a big and massive day. And it's not big or massive because it's a national holiday. It's not big and massive because of the egg hunt that our kids are having. It's a big and massive day. Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, today is the biggest hoax of human history. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then today is the biggest turning point in human history. In fact, today made history. And you see, it's true for, for all of us that the most memorable moments of our lives, there's usually some kind of surprise ending. There's something that happens that's unexpected. I remember a couple years ago, I was driving home late from work, and it happened to be trash night in our neighborhood, and, and at that time in our family, I was the trash guy. Like, I take out the trash, and I just want to know where are my people are. Raise your hand if you're the trash person in your family. If you're the person, God bless you, okay? That's a thankless job, but you take the trash out. Thank you for that. And, and so, you know, and, and now that our kids are a little bit older, like, they take out the trash. So if you've got little kids, like, it, it, it gets better. You know what I mean? Like, they can take out the trash and do some things. And, but on this particular night, I was taking out the trash, and it was really dark. And as I was walking towards the curb, all of a sudden, I felt this furry thing crawl over my knuckles. And it freaked me out. And I jumped back and I was filling in all the blanks trying to figure out what I thought it was and couldn't see very well. And, and so I walked up to the trash can and I kicked the trash can. And all of a sudden, you guys, this giant rat 
popped his head up out of the trash can. I'm telling you, it was like, it was like Godzilla, Kong, and then trash can rat. Like that's, that's, that's how it felt in that moment. And this rat and I, we kind of looked each other in the eye and I can't prove it, but I swear he whispered to me, I'm going to kill you. Like that's what I heard in my heart was he is going to kill me. And, and so I ran upstairs, I ran upstairs and I woke my wife up and, and I had her put her hand over my heart and it was beating so fast. And she said, is, is your heart beating for me because you love me? I said, no, I almost died for you, okay? You don't even know what I just went through. And the next Tuesday, it was trash night again, and it was pretty late, and I, I walked over to the trash can, and, and this time I had a, a pole with me, and I was kind of like walking, or a little broom, and I, I, I hit the trash can, and again, that giant rat popped up his head, and this time he chased me, right? And I'm running like a screaming, like a five-year-old girl, just screaming my head off. You see, that moment will forever be seared in my brain because what I expected to happen didn't. Something unexpected happened, something surprising. And you see, the Jesus story, the resurrection of Jesus, became so memorable, memorable became so unforgettable that 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating because of the surprise ending. You see, friends, Jesus can't be partially true. C.S. Lewis, the brilliant 20th century thinker and writer, he said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And so the singular question we are going to look at today is this. Did Jesus actually rise from the dead or was it all a hoax? Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we should doubt him and honestly dismiss him. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then the only proper response is to trust him because he is in fact God. Now, John, who wrote one of the historical accounts of the life of Jesus. He was an eyewitness. Like he walked with Jesus and he recorded everything that happened and he takes detailed notes of that very first Easter morning where the surprise of all surprises happened. And as we're gonna see, we're gonna meet two different people who doubted Jesus in in various different ways. And we're gonna see together what this ancient, true, historical story of Jesus Christ rising from the dead tells us about him and about how he feels about us. See, the first thing we're going to talk about this morning is this, Jesus loves broken people. John chapter 20, verse 1, the story begins like this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the historical accounts of the life of Jesus, they all four say that a group of women were the very first to the tomb. But they showed up on that very first morning, not because they expected Jesus to be alive, but they were going to prepare his body for permanent burial. You see, everybody doubted that very first Easter morning. But all four of these gospels, they tell us, they specifically name Mary Magdalene as one of the women who came to the tomb. Now, why is that significant? It's because if you know Mary's backstory, she was demon-possessed before she met Jesus. That Mary, B.C., she was broken. She was wounded. She was a social outcast, and she was lonely. And the truth is, we are all like Mary in some ways. There's things that you've done and things that have been done to you that have left you broken, betrayed, and wondering what's next. You may even worry right now in this moment that Jesus couldn't possibly love a broken or a hurting person like you. But remember, when Jesus met Mary Magdalene, she was also broken, but he didn't leave her broken. 
He healed her. He forgave her sins. And Jesus transformed Mary's life. You see, Jesus wasn't just some interesting philosopher or some teacher to Mary. No, he was the source of her healing, her salvation, her joy, and her brand new life. And friends, 2,000 years later, Jesus wants to be all that and more to you. This is why, as we'll see in the next part of our story, Mary can't stop crying. In fact, four times John tells us that Mary is bawling her eyes out. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. You see, before this moment, Mary is just ugly crying. That is the snot and the tears are everywhere. She, she's crying so bad she can't even see that it's Jesus. Are you that person in your family where maybe it's like the Hallmark movie comes on and you're just ugly snot crying? Or, or like my wife, Sarah, she always loves to show me like proposal videos, like wedding proposal videos on YouTube. And she's crying. She's a hot mess. And I'm like, babe, we don't even know them. We don't know these people. But you're crying like we do. I don't know if you're like that person. But Mary is crying so bad that she can't even see that it's Jesus until he says her name. Until he says Mary. You see, she had grown up her whole life hearing people call her all kinds of awful names. But Jesus says, I know you. And just like Mary experienced, God knows everything about you. That whether you're here in the worship center, you're joining us online right now, or you're in the community terrace, Jesus knows everything about you. He knows your name. He knows your past. He knows the burdens you carry. He knows your sin. He knows your story. He knows every thought you think. And he knows every single secret you keep. And there was a time in Mary's life where she doubted that Jesus could love her because she assumed she was too broken. But that didn't stop Jesus. And it never stops Jesus from loving broken people. You see here, here's the good news of Easter. It's evidence that Jesus loves broken people. And he's pursuing all of us. A couple months ago, I met a man at Starbucks. His name was Ernie, and, and we got to talking, and he shared with me that he was a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and I asked him if he would share his story with me. And he said, yeah, you know, a, a little while ago, uh, my wife and I got divorced, and, and she took the kids, and, and I just convinced myself, I just made a declaration in that moment that I wanted nothing to do with God. And he said, because I was convinced God wanted nothing to do with me. Well, one Monday, Ernie was at the grocery store doing some shopping, and this woman that he had never met before came up to him and said, sir, would it be okay if I prayed for you? Which is a little abrasive, right? Like, that's kind of intense Christianity. So she goes, can I, can I pray for you? And he said, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. And she said, sir, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I just feel like God wants me to pray for you. And so she started praying for him. Well, he got really freaked out and, and he dropped his groceries and left the store. On that Wednesday, two days later, Ernie found himself in a Starbucks and the guy behind him in line kind of struck up a conversation and they were getting to know each other a little bit. And, and out of the blue, this man said, I know this sounds really strange, Ernie, but could I pray for you? And again, Ernie was like, this is weird. No, I, I, I gotta go. And he just grabbed his drink and he left. Friday, two days later, Ernie is in the grocery store. His kids will be visiting him that weekend and he's in the candy aisle wanting to pick out the perfect candy for his kids. When a man comes up standing next to him and says, 
You getting some candy for your kids? And, and Ernie explains the situation. And, and the man says, oh, I know exactly what that's like. He said, I'm also a single dad. And then he said this to Ernie. He said, the only thing that got me through and that gets me through that hard season is my relationship with Jesus. Can I pray for you, Ernie? <laughs> That's good, right? Ernie breaks into tears and surrenders his life to Christ. Because you see, the resurrection of Jesus proves that no matter how broken we are, God loves us right where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. But the story continues. And number two, Jesus loves skeptical people. Verse 24 goes like this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Thomas did, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas, looking at Jesus, said, My Lord and my God. Now, <laughs> what an awkward, bad morning for Thomas to sleep in, right? It's Easter morning. Thomas hit the snooze button one too many times. He sleeps in, misses seeing Jesus with the other disciples, but the disciples think that's okay. They're like, hey, no worries. Jesus is back from the dead. And then Thomas does something totally surprising. He, he, he gets real about his doubts. To the rest of the disciples, he says, I don't buy it. I, I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But then something spectacular happens and you can almost miss it. The text says a week later, which means that Thomas remained a part of the community. Even though he wasn't totally sure about Jesus, even though he wasn't convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, he remained a part of the community. Which I, I think there's some of you here who you're maybe in a state of, of deconstructing your faith. Maybe you're reconstructing your faith. Maybe you're unsure about church. Maybe this was like a really big moment for you, even coming to a church or coming back to a church. Here's what you need to know about Purpose Church. Purpose Church is a safe place to ask any question. Purpose Church is a safe place to not have all the answers. Purpose Church is a safe place to be on a journey trying to discover who Jesus is. And the disciples, they modeled that for us. You see, in the same way that Thomas remained in the community, the community, they made room for Thomas. Now, make no mistake about it. It didn't change what the disciples believed. It didn't change what they saw and what they knew to be true. They were absolutely convinced Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead. But it created this opportunity for when Thomas would then see Jesus. Thomas researched he leaned in instead of running away and he discovered who Jesus really is. And today, if you're here and you're feeling a little skeptical, I want you to know that your great questions deserve great answers. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus proves that God doesn't turn away from skeptics. He runs towards us and will reveal himself to us. You see, in a similar way to Mary, Thomas doubted Jesus. He doubted that Jesus actually rose from the dead, but that didn't stop Jesus. But it's 2024, and I want to ask you a question. Is it reasonable in 2024 to believe God exists, to believe the Bible is true, and to believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul, who was convinced Jesus didn't rise from the dead until he met Jesus and his whole life was transformed, he wrote in 
chapter 1, verse 20 of Romans, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that, the, so that people are without excuse. Is it reasonable to believe even that a God could exist? Well, the teleological argument says that the structures of the universe... The way our universe and our planet is laid out points to a designer. It doesn't point to this being accidental, but points to an intentional designer. Scientists talk about something called the 122 constants. There are 122 scientific laws that prove the miraculous nature of life on planet Earth. Here's just two of them. On Earth's atmosphere, oxygen takes up 21%. Oxygen takes up 21% of Earth's atmosphere. Scientists tell us that if it was a percent higher or a percent lower, immediately flames would erupt everywhere on planet Earth and none of us could survive. You know what that means? That means as you walked into this room, as, as we have taken countless breaths in and exhaled, it's as if God is screaming to us, here's the scientific evidence you need. I created this place perfectly for you so that you would know me. Scientists also tell us that if gravity on planet Earth was altered by 0.00000000, that's 34 zeros, 0001 percent, that we would no longer have the sun in our orbit and we would die. So, so the, the thing that enables you to continue to breathe and to stay right now in your seat are all evidence of God's existence. In fact, in fact, Sir, Sir Francis Bacon, which, by the way, if you've got bacon in your last name, I'm just inclined to trust you, okay? So this guy, he, he's genius. He's also got bacon in his name. He said this, a little knowledge of science makes a man an atheist, but an in-depth study of science makes him a believer in God. What about the Bible? The biblical argument is this, every single archaeological discovery continues to support and affirm the historical reliability of the locations, people, and events recorded in the Bible. Dr. Hugh Ross, an astrophysicist, he says this, the Bible contains 2,500 prophecies, which are predictions from God of things that are going to happen in the future. And 2,000 of them have already been fulfilled. The chances of this happening by chance are 10 to the 2,000th power. But what about the resurrection? I mean, it's a crazy claim that 2,000 years ago, this guy named Jesus of Nazareth, he died on a cross and then he came back to life. Friends, I would suggest there is no other logical explanation for what happened next in history. Let's go back to Thomas. Thomas, after seeing Jesus and declaring him, my Lord and my God, his life was forever changed. By the year 52 AD, he sails all the way down to the southern part of India. And for 20 years, he spends his life testifying and proclaiming to everyone he sees, Jesus Christ died for your sins and he rose from the dead and he is God. Until eventually, he's murdered. In fact, a couple months ago, I had the privilege of going to India. I got to go to the southern part of India where Thomas was murdered and where he was buried in 72 AD. And at this burial site, there's a building that's dedicated to the disciples and what happened to them and what they did after they saw Jesus rise from the dead. You see, testifying to the resurrection, it didn't get the disciples a lot of money. It didn't get them a blue check on their social media account. It didn't get them a lot of fame or comfort. But instead, it cost them their lives. The disciples were murdered because they told everyone what they saw. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He rose from the dead. And he is the only way to be right with God and have eternal life. In fact, Thomas was pierced to death in India in 72 AD. Simon was sawed in half in Edessa in 65 AD. Jude was beaten to death in Edessa in 65 AD. Matthias was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem in 80 AD. 
James, son of Zebedee, was stabbed to death in Agrippa in 44 AD. Matthew was staked and speared to death in Ethiopia in 60 AD. Bartholomew was skinned alive in Armenia in 72 AD. Philip was crucified in Heliopolis in 54 AD. John was boiled in oil and died later in Turkey in 98 AD. James, son of Alphaeus, was thrown off the temple and beaten to death in Jerusalem in 90 AD. Andrew was crucified in southern Greece in 60 AD. And Peter was crucified upside down in Rome in 68 AD. The only logical explanation for their willingness to die was that they actually saw what they told everyone they saw. Jesus is alive. Which leads to our last and final big idea, number three. Jesus saves and gives new life to broken and skeptical people. John writes in verse 31, but these are written. He means everything I've told you about what Jesus taught, the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's all been recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, friends, for 2,000 years, People have been putting their faith in Jesus. Billions of people have surrendered their lives to Christ and he has transformed them from the inside out. Just like these people. Love you. 
you painted It's your masterpiece Selfless love hanging on a tree For me Your outstretched arms are portrait For all to see Isn't it true Jesus changes everything? In John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God hated broken people. It doesn't say that God's dis disinterested and skeptical or hopeless or hurting people. It says, for God so loved the world. That means that God loves you. And he demonstrated his love for you by giving his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, how is all of this possible? It's because Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus came back from the dead, proving, proving that every single sin can be forgiven, proving that he is God Almighty, which means the only proper response is to surrender your life to Jesus, to worship him alone and to follow him every day of your life. Now here's what's true about every single one of us in this room or watching online or out on the community terrace. Every single one of us has faith. Every one of us has chosen to put our faith in something. The question is, where is your faith? In Luke chapter 8, verse 25, Jesus said to his disciples, where is your faith? To help me demonstrate this, I want to invite up my friends, Pastor Claire and Pastor Marcus. You guys can come up here real quick. And, and for some of you, maybe you've heard that word faith before, and it sounds like a religious term, and you're not sure exactly what does that mean. Well, faith is, is kind of like this. Here, Pastor Marcus, we're going to have you play the Jesus character, okay? So you come right up here. You got that holy glow, you know what I mean? Like, bald is beautiful, so you get to be Jesus, okay? Sorry, I'm just a little biased. I'm biased, okay? Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold on to that rope as tightly as you can. And Pastor Claire, you're going to hold on that rope. And here's what I want you to do, Pastor Claire. I want you to lean back and he's going to hold you up. Okay, Pastor Marcus, remember, don't drop her. That ruins the illustration. So uh, hold that. <laughs> Pastor Claire, I want you to go ahead and lean back. All right, you can go lean back a little bit more. There you go. Really strong. He is very strong, very strong. <laughs> you see, what you're seeing right now, this is faith. The word faith means to put your trust in, to give your allegiance to, to believe not just in some intellectual way, but with every part of your life. And Jesus designed us to put our faith in him because he can hold us up, because he can save us, because everything he said and everything he did is true. But, but here's the problem. You can go ahead and come on up real quick. Um, here, here's the problem is for many of us, instead of putting our faith in Jesus, we put our faith in things that could never hold us up. We, we put our faith in the salary that we make at work. We, we put our faith in the zip code we live in. We put our faith in our education. We, we put our faith in our kids' behavior at Target. Come on. <laughs> and the problem is those things were never designed to hold us up. And if I said, Pastor Claire, as one of your pastors, I'm asking you to lean back right now. I hope you would say no. <laughs> and yet, for so many of us, we say yes every single day. You see, Jesus Christ... He made it clear to us that the resurrection of Jesus proves that if we trust in Jesus, we will be saved from our sins. 
saved for God's purpose for our lives and have eternal life with him. Now, I want to give every single one of us in this room an opportunity to put our faith in Jesus. I don't know how you got here today. I don't know who invited you. Maybe you saw something online or you saw one of the purpose yard signs or maybe a neighbor, a friend, a coworker invited you and you weren't totally sure. Maybe somebody guilted you to be here and you're like, ah, it's Easter. I should probably go to church. And that's why you're here. But I want to let you know, that's actually not why you're here. You're here because God moved in such a powerful way 2,000 years ago to get you here so that you could hear what he did for you and you could put your faith in him and you could trust him and worship him and surrender to him and follow him every day of your life. In the program you were given towards the back, there's a prayer, a prayer that you could pray to begin a relationship with Jesus. And I, I just want to read it for us before I invite you to pray it along with me. It says, Jesus, I confess that my sin is a problem I can't fix. I believe that you died on the cross to forgive me. I trust that you rose from the dead, proving you are God. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Today and every day, I choose to follow you. Now there's, I believe, many of you in this room today who have never put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've come to church before. Maybe you've read some Bible verses. Maybe you've got a family member, a friend, or a coworker who's like a really uber Christian. You're just kind of like tacking onto their faith. It doesn't work like that. This is between you and God. Have you placed your full faith in Jesus? Today, right now, is your opportunity. And so I wanna invite everyone in this room right now to close their eyes. Anyone joining us online or out in the community terrace to just close their eyes right now. And I wanna ask you a question. Do you have a relationship with the risen Jesus? Have you put your faith in Christ? If you haven't, and you wanna do that right now, this is your moment. I wanna invite you right now to raise your hand up in the air as a way of saying, Jesus, I am choosing to surrender my life to you. I want you to raise your hand right now as a way of saying, Jesus Christ, I am putting my faith in you. I receive what you did for me. Whether you're in the balcony or here or outside, I want you to raise your hand as a way of saying, Jesus Christ, I put my faith in you. And from where you're at right now, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Say, Jesus, I confess that my sin is a problem I can't fix. I believe that you died on the cross to forgive me. I trust that you rose from the dead proving you are God. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Today and every day, I choose to follow you. You can go ahead and open your eyes right now and for those of you that received Christ for the very first time, we have a gift for you out at the Connect Center. And in your program is a QR code. We'd love to follow up with you and encourage you in this decision that you made. And we have a gift for you, whether you're a guest or you gave your life to Christ. Maybe your next step is to get baptized at the end of this service. But we want to continue to celebrate. And there were several of you in the balcony in here who chose to put your faith in Christ. And you're a part of the family of God. And we want to celebrate. And so on the count of three, if you put your faith in Christ, I want you to stand and declare that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Stand with me if you gave your life to Christ on the count of three. One, two, three. Shout.
these bones will see great great grateful that every single one of you joined us today. And if you, just a few moments ago, put your faith in Jesus for the first time, please stop at our Connect Center in our lobby. We have a gift that we would love to give you. And if you would like to take that next step and be baptized in our heated water, we have... <laughs> We, we have everything you need. You can register for baptisms on the north side of this building. And for all of us, let's celebrate our brothers and sisters in the Lord by going outside the doors right behind us on the east side of this building. And if there are any ways that we could be praying for you, please join us to my left and your right in our prayer room. We love you all so much, and we will see you all next Sunday for week one of our new series, A Better Way. Happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. He is risen indeed.